David Williams, David Williams, the Jesus Ministries. We are talking today by the grace of God about how to get things done. Talking today by the grace of God about real ministry to you, real ministry from God to you. So ever since the fall of mankind, ever since the fall of mankind, the ministry has been to destroy and to rebuild. Ever since the fall of mankind, the ministry has been to break down what the fall caused and to rebuild. So what did the fall cause? The fall of man caused independence from God. It caused man to reject God. That's what the fall caused. So the fall of man caused man to behave in an independent, aggressively rebellious way against his maker. All right. So you need to understand that that's what the fall caused. What is the fall? It's what happened in Genesis chapter three. That's what happened in Genesis chapter three, when man ate of the fruit and then he became a rebel. He became a rebel. He became independent and independent in the ears of some might sound pleasurable but in the in but that's like unplugging your television while you're watching it that's like disconnecting your your phone your satellite signal on your phone that's or your tower signal uh, that's 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 independence right it's like removing the, the the engine from your car it's what it's like it's like disconnecting the nerves in the back of your neck uh, from from your brain to the rest of the body, but ben, ben, below the neck, below the shoulder area. Yeah, that 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 doesn't sound good, does it? So our idea of independence is an 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 illusion. It's an illusion. It's an illusion because we are not self-made. We are not God, and since we are not self-made, since we are made by God, we need God. Since you are made by God, you need God to survive and to succeed. So since you are made by God, you need God daily to survive and daily to succeed. And, and so the ministry of the prophets, those ordained of God, those created by God, to speak to man because God picks men out from the masses God picks sons and daughters out from the masses to minister to the masses God picks men from out of the masses to minister to the masses God calls people from crowds from families Jesus called his disciples from their jobs and you can still work a job and be called from the job to the people on your job called from school to the people on your school in your school called from Ethiopia to the Ethiopians called from Libya to the Libyans called from Angola to the Angolans come called from Kazakhstan to the Kazakhstanians or to the, or the Kazakhstans or the Mongolians. Absolutely. The Lord called the Jews from the Jews to preach to the Jews and then to preach to the Gentiles. And then he called. So God will call you from people to preach to the people. Whether he leaves you in that region, whether he leaves you in that area, whether he leaves you. So what that means is he separates your stream of information. It means he separates what you hear from what they hear. God is separating what you will perceive from what they will perceive. God distinguishes what you understand from what they understand. Not to make you better in the sense that you boast or in the sense that you are to walk in the midst of your family or your society as though they're bad and you are good. It, it, it's like the firemen or the doctors or the pilots or the policemen or the metal workers. Yeah, their job is to be excellent so that they can 
produce excellence in their society. So the Spirit of God will call you from your society to be excellent in your society, for your society, on behalf of the kingdom of God, as an emissary, as an ambassador, as a child of God. So God calls people, regular, red-blooded people, to himself. And what that means is he begins to talk to them in their minds, or in their ears, or through their eyes, or in their hearts, in their inner spirits, he begins to talk to them. The Spirit of God begins to talk to people, and he begins to show them the way that he wants them to go. He begins to show them the way that he wants others to go. So God will call people from people and then have them understand God's will for the people. And they will communicate to the people. And when the people obey their instruction, the people will become more like God, have more access to God, and have more access to his provision and his protection. So that's what the Spirit of God is doing. So the fall of man, the fall of man caused people to misunderstand who God is and it ruined man's access to God. So now God has to call these prophets. So he calls you a prophet in two regards. In one sense, he calls you a prophet because he now speaks to you with clarity. He speaks to you with clarity and gives you the ability to understand the difference between what you are hearing from your world and what you are hearing from God. Isn't that, an, isn't that amazing? Isn't that a blessing? That God can enable you to distinguish what you hear from him from what you hear from the world around you. It's amazing. It's an exceptionally good thing that God lets you by the Spirit distinguish the truth, distinguish light from darkness, reality from fiction. That's incredibly amazing. It's a great blessing that God does that for us. So the Spirit of God calls us from people who hear things a certain way, and he allows us to hear his voice with clarity. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He said, they do not follow the voice of strangers. They don't recognize, they don't acknowledge, they don't respect nor honor strange voices. They can distinguish. And so the Spirit of God wants us to be able to distinguish. He wants us to be able to hear his voice from the voices of others. And so ever since the fall of mankind, what happened in Genesis chapter 3, when man ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it separated his mind from the mind of God. And now he thinks thoughts that are confused. So now we think confused thoughts. Our understanding of right and wrong has been distorted. Our ability to perceive God's will has been ruined and damaged. It's been damaged. And so the Lord elects people from the population and he speaks to them according to his own will. And they understand his voice and they begin to speak to the other people in their families, in their cities, in societies. And then when those people hear the voices of these who have been elected to hear from God with clarity, then the people who hear and obey are the ones who gain greater access to God, his promises, his protection, his, his, his provision, his pleasure. The word of God says that in the, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures eternally there are pleasures forevermore so the fall separated us from God collectively collectively man became separated from God uh, through the fall and what we gained was pride what we gained was pride and lust and lust describes wanting more than you're supposed to have because it's not good for you right and Pride describes having a sense of, having a false sense of strength, having a false sense of confidence. It describes having a, a separate perspective or belief system than that of God's. 
you think this is right and you are confident that this is right, but it isn't. So that's what pride describes. It describes thinking that something is good or beautiful or powerful, but it's bad, ugly, and destructive. It describes having your own thoughts in contradiction to God's. Having your own feelings and forcefully asserting aggressively asserting your own perspectives so that's what we got we got pride lust and fear that's what we got in the garden of eden when we fell we didn't have that before before we didn't have that so ever since the fall of man god has been electing people and then he calls them prophets so in one sense you're a prophet because he's called you from your society Though he, though he might physically leave you within that group of people. He calls you from that society in that they don't hear God as clearly as you hear God. They don't obey God as accurately as you obey God. That's his prerogative. There is some powerful word on that right now that I want to share with you. I got to share this word with you. The Lord lets me. Because we need to understand that God does that. I'm telling you right now. And it's in the book of Job. It is so amazing if I can find it fast enough to get it to you. But um, there's a scripture. It talks about how God calls people out and how he, um, he tells them things. Uh, that, that Let's see if I can find it. It says if there's one of a thousand or something like that. And, I, and I'll find it eventually, but in the, in the meantime, because man gained pride, God has to call people from pride to speak to people who are controlled by it. And he speaks to the people, enabling, the, enabling those he's called out to be humble enough to A, say what God is saying instead of what they, from their own thoughts, would say. Because the, 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 the godly still hear their own thoughts, but they can distinguish their thoughts from the thoughts of God. Progressively, that's what happens. Progressively, that's what happens. So the righteous have the capacity to behave in an erratic and a violent way. But the power of God prohibits them, prevents them from yielding to those thoughts and those desires. And so that's the difference between those that God calls into the kingdom and those who God leaves outside of the kingdom to be ministered to by those who are in the kingdom. And so God will call us into the kingdom to minister to those who are outside of the kingdom to see if we can get them into the kingdom and to see if we can sustain those who have been called into the kingdom. So in one sense, we are prophets in that we are called into the kingdom. Our minds are transformed. Our hearts are transformed progressively. And we become a mouthpiece for God to people who, like us, were controlled by lust, pride, confusion, rebellion, disobedience. And so the Spirit of God calls us into the kingdom to speak to those who are outside of the kingdom to see if they would want to come into the kingdom. So, so... In one sense, you're a prophet because it's the will of God that he calls you in. And in another sense, you're a prophet in that you are given constant and frequent access to his voice and his understanding. You're given constant and frequent access to the communication of the Lord. The word of God says, he that hears speaks constantly. It also says, the Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Why do we speak? Jeremiah said to the Lord, Jeremiah decided to stop speaking the word of God because of the hostility he was experiencing from his society. And he said that God had tricked him. He said that God had deceived him because God, because Jeremiah was under the impression in his natural mind, the prophet Jeremiah thought that he could either accept this calling or reject it. He thought he could either accept this calling or reject it. But because God was continually speaking to him and because God's word in his heart was so overwhelming, 
that even when Jeremiah was buckling to the pressure of the rejection of his society, he still could not stop speaking what he was hearing because it would overwhelm him and it would flow out like water and or like fire. It was consuming. And so he said to himself, because of the hostility and the rejection of his peers, parents and, and other people, he said to himself, he said, I'm not going to keep speaking this word because it brings a lot of hostility and rejection. But when I thought to stop speaking when I thought that I was no longer going to be speaking your word was in me like fire shut up in my bones and I couldn't hold back I couldn't hold back because I kept seeing what you were saying and so he says you've deceived me I thought I could just lay this down I thought I could just not say I thought I could just not speak but the more that I dreamt the more that I saw the more that I heard by your spirit it just forced me to speak when I said I would not speak. And so I have to speak because it's overwhelming. It's too much. I, 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 can't, I can't stop speaking what it is I'm hearing. I can't stop speaking where I'm, where, where, uh, what I'm hearing. See if you can help me find. I, I know. Oh, I found it. See, I was about to ask you, but I guess the Lord didn't want me to ask you. I said, I, I said let me ask the people. The Lord said, no, don't ask them. Ask me, wait for me. I want to read this to, to you. Uh, this is Job 33, uh, verse... Uh, mm, let's see. Job 33, verse... Okay, so I want to read you this whole thing, okay? It's beautiful. Uh, hopefully you can accept it and it'll bless you. So this is Job 33. And, and this young man, Elihu, is rebuking Job because of Job's frustration and his frustration caused him to be arrogant in his words and so this young man is confronting Job's words and he says this in Job 33 and, and verse 12 he says this to Job he says this to Job or, or I'll start reading verse 8 Job 33 verse 8 surely you have spoken in my hearing the man is saying to Job I heard you say uh, that I, verse 9, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. So the man is saying to Job, you are saying that you are completely innocent. Verse 10, behold, he finds, God finds occasions against me. He counts me for his enemy. So the guy is saying to Job, you're accusing God of mistreating you. Verse 11, he puts my feet in the stocks. He marks all my paths. The guy is saying to Job, you're saying that everything that you're experiencing is God's fault. Verse 12, behold, in this you are not just. You're wrong about that. He says to Job, behold, in this you are not just. I will answer you that God is greater than man. So he makes that point. And why is he making that point? Because the job of the prophet is to tear down what is so that he can build what's supposed to be. That's real ministry. That's the ministry of the prophet. That's where the hostility comes from as it relates to the prophet's call to his friends, family, and his society. The prophet's job is to tear down what the fall caused and what the fall developed. The pride that came from the fall of man, the prophet's job is to confront that, tear down it and what it's built, and then to rebuild in the place of these pri of pride to build the love of God, the love for God. And so it says this right here. He says this to Job. He says, he says, behold, in this you are not just. I will answer you that God is greater than men. Why do you strive against him? For he gives not account of any of his matters. He doesn't have to explain to you why things are the way that they are. And so the proud believe that God owes them an explanation for what he says and what he does and what he permits to occur in the world. The proud believe that God owes them an explanation. The man says to Job, God does not owe anybody an explanation. Just like I don't have to convince any of my dollar bills why I am spending them and what I'll spend them on. So when I go to the grocery stores, the hardware stores, the markets, 
I don't have to talk to the plastic cards and say to the cards, all right now, I'm going to buy this shirt. All right, let me explain to you why. I don't have to talk to the cards, to the paper, to the coins, and explain anything to them. They're mine, they are completely in my hand to use them as I see fit. And God says to man, hey listen, I know what the fall did to your mind. I know it made you think that you are entitled to know everything I say, everything I do. I know you think that you have a right to control what happens in your life, you don't. And because you don't, but think you do, We've got to have some tough conversation. And so he says this to Job. Why do you strive against him in verse 12, verse 13? For he gives not account of any of his matters. And then he goes on and says this in verse 14. For God speaks once, yes, 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 twice. Yet man perceives it not, yet man doesn't realize it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men and slumberings on their bed, then he opens, then he opens, then that prophetic, powerful word from God comes. Then he opens the ears of men and seals or locks in and solidifies their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. So you've got the prophets and then you've got the masses and the prophets and the prophet might be the apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher evan you know a miracle worker guy who interprets tongues the lord calls the prophet from the world and convinces them that they cannot live according to their own thoughts or according to their own traditions and standards hey come over here you cannot live that way now go to these people and tell them that they can't live the way that they are living Tell them that their independence is actually a disconnection. Tell them that their perceptions of independence are actually a distraction and that their perceptions of independence and freedom is actually bondage, is actually enslavement. Go and tell them that. And my power will be with you to persuade them, to convince them, to reveal to them that what you are saying is not from your physical body, your brain your personal ideals but that it's from god almighty and so he calls the prophets to himself preventing the prophets from going off and being what they would consider to be excellent to god okay so the prophets many times are skilled people people who if they put their hands to the secular work and world they'd excel because there are gifts and talents that they have that the world would appreciate now not every prophet is that way some people are different they're 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 feeble in their thinking they're weak in their in their skills and and nobody wants them and nobody wants them and god just says come here i want to talk to you i want to tell you some things that are going to shake your world and, and, and when you speak, your world is going to tremble and people will wonder what's actually happening. The Lord does that in order to show man that it's not about your natural wisdom. It's not about your natural skillfulness, your natural beauty. It's about you. It's about the, the favor, the purpose and the access that God is giving you to him. So God will call the skilled and the unskilled. And when he calls the unskilled, it's very, very it just gives him more glory, more credit, more honor. It makes people say, where did they get this knowledge from? How is it that you can speak so clearly like that? Where did you learn how to do that? How did you know this right here? And so all you can say is, well, I don't know. It just comes from God. And then, of course, he calls the skilled. And he hides pride from the skilled. So God will call people to himself, teach them things, give them a heart to know him. And when they know him, they no longer do what they were planning to do. They no longer go after the things they were planning to build. They no longer pursue their, their ambitions. They begin to pursue the face of God and the kingdom of God. And so when God speaks to us in these dreams and in these visions and with his voice, it hides pride from us. His word to us redirects our steps. Oh, I was going to do this. I was going to pursue that. But now that I'm hearing from God, like I'm hearing from God, I'm no longer ambitious about those things this is what i wanted to do but i i no longer want to do that anymore and so it says that god will speak to you in your dreams even if you don't remember 
the dreams, but that the dreams from the Lord redirect your steps. And so you may have pursued something, a goal, in order to achieve status or world respect, respect from your peers, respect from your parents, honor from those that you that you regard. But because God speaks to you in your dreams, it re it diverts your decision making. But you feel the diversion, you feel the redirecting simply as a thought or as an emotion. You know what? Never mind, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do this. To you, it's just an inner impulse. But you are actually being prompted by the Lord to do that. And he may have told you that several weeks, months, or years ago in your dreams to ensure that you don't do what you think will be good, but rather that you do what you are ordained and called and cultivated of God to do. And so he says this right here. He says, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men in slumberings on, their bed, on the bed, he opens the ears of men. Your sensitivity to the voice of God, he opens the ears of men and seals or locks in their instruction, all right? Their ability to know what to build. The Holy Ghost will, will teach you by his spirit what and how to build. And then he says this in verse 17. He does this that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. So nobody can say, I am doing this because I am skilled. He goes on and says this in verse 18. He, God, keeps back his soul, man's soul, from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword or by violence. He's saying that God speaks to you and speaks through you so that you and others are redirected from death and hell. Verse, verse 19, he says this, he is chastened. He, the people of God, the person of God, the child of God, he is chastened also with pain on his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. So God will allow us to go through suffering sometimes so that his, so that his life hates meat so that he has so that he loses his appetite and his soul dainty meat he loses his appetite for all kinds of food verse 21 his flesh is consumed the way that it can't be seen and why is god saying this god is saying this because man puts a lot of investment in his flesh have you ever exercised for a period of time and then gotten sick and then you couldn't eat for a few days or you couldn't uh exercise for a few days and it seems like all the work that you put in you just lost in a matter of four days. You've been exercising for four months, five months, and you're cultivating your muscles, and you feel good about yourself. You look in the mirror, and you think that, man, I'm awesome. So when I wear this shirt, I fill this shirt out. Oh, yeah, man. I the shirt is tight on me. The shirt is tight on me like skin. I feel excellent. I feel awesome. I feel beautiful. I feel handsome. Absolutely. I feel handsome. I feel awesome. Yeah, and then you get a little cold, and, and then you just have to stay in bed for two and a half to three days. You don't eat like you normally would. Your caloric intake drops, and then when you look in the mirror, you're like, what's going on? I lost all my gains. And then it makes you realize how frail you are. Like, man, what am I doing? I work hard every day at this, and in a matter of three days... It seems like all of it's gone. And you might say, yeah, that's true. But if you get back on it, then it'll be better. That's true. That's true. That's true. But you can lose it in a few days. And that's what. It, and so God is trying to convince you that what the, the attitude and the perspective that man developed in the Garden of Eden when he fell away from God, that there's no value in that perspective. There's no value. There's very limited value in all of that work, all of that toil that you're putting in. It says in verse 21, his flesh is consumed away that it can't be that it cannot be seen. His bones that were not seen stick out. They never saw your rib cage. Now they see your rib cage. Verse 22. Yes, his soul draws near to the grave and his life. Listen to this. Yes, his soul draws near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. That is a reference to those that are in hell to torment. That is a reference to the tormenting entities in hell. The young man is preaching to Job and saying to Job, listen, this is how things work. 
this is how things work all right man's life is not as valuable as man thinks it is why is he doing that because he has to destroy what was built in the garden the pride the arrogance the entitlement the independence the sense that i can do what i want to do so god has to destroy that in order to rebuild the mind of christ the kingdom of god in you through you in order for you to be a real son of god and so he says this yes his soul draws near to the grave and his life to the destroyers is talking about those who die and go to hell and suffer eternally so what does god do to protect us from this death and from destruction look at verse 23 in job 33 if there be a messenger with him an interpreter one among a thousand to show to man his uprightness god's uprightness then god then he is gracious to him and says deliver him from going down to the pit i have found a ransom his flesh will be fresher than a child's. He will return to the days of his youth. He will pray to God and he will be favorable unto him. And he will see, the f and he will see God's face, his face with joy. For he will render or give to man his God's righteousness. Uh, he looks on men and if any say, he, he God looks on men and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right and it didn't benefit me he God will deliver his soul from going into the pit and his life will see light lo or pay attention or look all these things works God oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living so he says that God sends messengers because people are going to physically and spiritually die. And so he says this. He says this is the way that men, this is their life. He says this is their life. He says yes, his soul draws near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. So that's where people are on their way to death and eternal punishment. But if there be a messenger, somebody that God has called out from the people, someone who gets hungry, just like the people get hungry, they get afraid at times for the same reasons the others get afraid. They get timid. They get hasty. They get impulsive. When Paul was preaching and the Lord through them worked a great miracle of healing the people wanted to worship them and said the gods of the of the uh, I forget which country the gods are come down to to the gods have come, come down to earth in the likeness of men they thought Paul was a god they thought his other minister friend Barnabas was a god all the gods have come down in the likeness of men and Paul said, listen, guys, we're not gods. We're men. We have physical bodies like you have physical bodies. The messengers of God are like regular people in the physical sense. They're regular. Listen, man, we grew up together. Okay? We were smoking the same weed, drinking the same beer and alcohol and whatever going to the same foul environments, fighting the same neighborhoods. We were doing all of that together. We were on our way to hell, laughing in church at things we didn't understand. We were doing that together. Yeah, man, watching evil things, playing evil games. We were doing all of that, chasing people that we wanted to be with physically. We were doing all of that. We were doing that, disrespecting our parents or elders or teachers or police, being abusive to people that we had the ability to abuse. We were doing all of that together. And all of a sudden, I began to have different thoughts. All of a sudden, my desires began to shift. Why? Well, because he and I and all of these other people that we know and love and hate are on our way to hell why are you on your way to hell because I do what I want to do and I think 
what I want to think and I believe what I believe and I follow my own ambitions. So why is that guy beginning to think differently? Why is she beginning to think differently? Well, verse 23 is going to explain God's will for people in a society being called from their society. Jesus said, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil. And so he takes us from the people and sends us to the people. He told Paul that specifically. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, go ye therefore to all the nations, to India, to Iran, to Brazil, to Paraguay. Believe, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and commits to the degree of baptism. He that believes and is baptized. He will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from death and destruction after death. Attack and harassment by demon spirits for the rest of his for the rest of his existence in eternity. So God calls people from the parties, from the Colombian parties, the Mexican parties, the Belize parties, the Jamaican parties, the the Cuban parties. Come here. God will call people when they're drunk. People who are laughing and joking at the card table, at the domino table, laughing and joking, drunk, drunk. And the Spirit of God will speak to them mightily in their hearts and minds. What are you doing here? I was in the midst of sin. Our brother David was about to fall off of the cliff of sin. I was about to sin mightily at the age of 18. I was about to do it. And as I was in the midst of my process to do bad things, a really bad thing, the Lord said to my heart, to my mind, what are you doing? What are you doing? Can I be, I don't know if I should use this phrase, vulgar. When the Lord saved me, I have, I have a mind. I think I did put it on Facebook. So I have a bracelet that I got in to 1997 when I committed my life to Jesus. I have a bracelet that I, I, so when I committed my life to Jesus, it was because my, my father took me to a men's conference in Miami, Florida in 1997. It was called the making of a godly man. I did not want to go to a men's conference. I went because in three days I was going to leave for the military. So I knew that it was something that my father wanted to do with me before I went off into the military. Uh, so I decided to accept the invitation. So my father says, David, I want us to go to this men's conference on Friday night and Saturday morning. It's a men's conference. Now, brother David was used to interacting with women at church. And because of the darkness of my heart and mind, Women were a big reason why Brother David even wanted to go to church. I'm not really here for God. I am here for God, but I have such limited access to him because of my mentality and my behavior that it doesn't really interest me to be here at church. So I come to church because I have to, because my father makes me go. But now that I'm here... I need to entertain myself. And what better way to entertain yourself as a young 18-year-old male than talking to the women and passing notes between each other at church when everybody thinks you're taking notes? Oh, this is good. Yeah, that's what Brother David was doing. So I didn't want to go to a men's conference. I'm 18 years old. I've just graduated high school. I don't want to go to a men's conference. All men? Wait, 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 all men? And so my father said, yes, it's for only men. That was like prison. Like, what? Is this prison? I don't want to go to prison. I'm about to go to the military. That's practical prison right there. And so, yeah, you're going to go. Uh, you're going to go. And so I went to the men's conference, and I dressed what I thought would be nicely because I, th I said to myself, I know that there are going to be women here. I know, there's no way. I've never been to a church service with no women. My father may be saying it's a men's conference. There's no way that there's no women here. I'm going to, there's women here. I'm, I'm, I, I have no questions about that. 
So, you know, I wore my football jersey and my jeans to see some women. There's, oh, there's women here. Trust me. I know that they're And when I got in there, 35,000 men, I was shocked. There are no women. There, some guys may have brought their wives. So out of 35,000 men, there may have been like 100 women that were invisible because, you know, it's in this huge stadium. Like, where are the women? Like, there are really no women here? So I have to sit through the service? How am I going to occupy my time? The worship is unappealing to me because I'm disconnected from God because I do a lot of, a lot of bad stuff that I don't really, really recognize is so, so bad. Where are the women? Like, really? So, King Saul met the man of God when he was looking for something. He was looking for donkeys. I'm going to use that term. He wasn't looking for women. He was looking for something else. I went to this conference looking for something else. And so the men, the all male choir, all men speaking. I'm like, really? All male choir? This is a good music, praise God. Good, you know, good men speaking. I, where are the women? Seriously? Men walking around shouting for Jesus. Jesus! Walking around with their shirts off, talking about Jesus. I said, this is crazy. This is a bizarre environment. This is bizarre. Church equals women. It doesn't equal this. This is bizarre. And so... The second speaker of the night when he led the people in prayer, I heard the voice of God. David, I know why you're here. I know why you're here, David. You're here for women, aren't you? No, Lord, I'm really here because my father brought me here. But I expected that the benefit of obedience would be women. And it's not been that. I guess I have to pay attention and take in this weird atmosphere with men worshiping God. In an expressive way, white men, black men, Spanish men, Chinese men, Asian, Indian, like, what, really, men do this? This is strange. And so the one pastor began to preach to us, so he began to lead us in prayer. As we were following him in prayer, I heard the voice of the Lord so mightily and so clearly, and it shook me out of my lust. It shook me out of my discouragement. It shook me out of my prison of pride. It shook, what is this? I heard this is the voice of God. I said, this is the voice of God. Brother David wasn't thinking about women. From that point forward, June 27th, 1997, to whatever today's date is, October 4th, 2019, Brother David has never gone to church seeking for women because the Lord looked beyond all of my faults and saw my need and delivered me while I was right there. I'm in pride. I'm in lust. I'm looking to see the world to sin. And in the midst of my mentality and my selfishness, hey, you, Go right there. What do you think about it? I think this is a bizarre place. Okay. But you can't leave, can you? You can't drive. Sit right here and listen to all of this. Oh, this is crazy. This is wild. And when the Lord began to speak to me, it shook me. Like, this is the voice of God. I must commit. I must commit. And then I just went down when the guy said okay so now we're going to open the floor for salvation I grabbed my father's hand we've got to go down there right now I, I, I don't even know what the man preached I don't know what he preached I don't even care at this point it was the Lord had already but the guy just led us in prayer and as we were following him in prayer the Lord opened my ears why because I was going to die and I was going to go I was going to be delivered to the destroyers. And God opened my ears. David, I know where you're going. Or I know where you think you're going. I know where you're trying to go. I know why you're doing what you're doing. It's okay. I got, I've got your number. I've got access to your ears. He opens the ears of men and locks in their instruction. I'm going to follow him forever. You guys don't hear him? 
I'm looking around. Does my father hear this? Does anybody hear this? This is the 35,000 men. Does anybody hear this? And I am looking. I can't pay attention from that point forward. I was overwhelmed. I was hearing the voice of God loudly, audibly. Like, this is God. I knew it 100%, 100%. This is the voice of God. When the guy said, who wants to be saved? I grabbed my father's hand. We have to go down there. We have to go down there right now. We have to go down there right now. I need to be saved. And I went down there. And I stood there and I prayed the prayer. Dear, G Dear Jesus. I believe in you. I believe in you. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I prayed that prayer a hundred times before that. That day, June 27th, 1997, I got water baptized before that. Felt bad about my sins before that. Nothing was like June 27th, 1997 for Brother Dave. I said, I, I said this God, God is real. God is real. God is real. I had never seen him manifest to that degree. Redirected me. Redirected me. And when I went to the military, I told those people, I don't want to be here. I told God, I said, God, I, I will serve you. I don't want to be here in this military. They said, they said, you, they said you, can't be, you can't leave. They said, it's either here or nowhere. I said, it's going to be nowhere. I'm not staying in this place. I don't want to do what you guys want me to do. So they sent me home after six weeks. Some brothers might be watching this who went to the military, and you might idolize that. Brother Dave was allowed to turn from that. You cannot have me. You can have them. You can't have Brother Dave. I'm out of here. I have to preach this gospel. God is real. You guys aren't going to control me and tell me where to go for the next three and a half to eight years. Absolutely not. Hey, I need to get out of here. You can't. You signed a contract. I'm not going to do it. Well, we're going to have to send you home. Yeah, you're going to have to send me home. Got home. Went to church. Okay, Lord. This is what we talked about when I was in jail slash the military. This is what we talked about. I am here for you. I changed my seat at church. I'm not going to sit in the back with these girls. I'm going to sit in the front where the grown men sit. I want the front row. I want to sit where the adults sit. Yeah. I want to sit with the grown people sit. I'm 18. I want to sit with the grown people sit. When I got back home, one of the ladies said to me, she thought I was ashamed that I left the military. She said, uh, it's, it don't feel any way. Don't feel embarrassed. I looked at her like, what are you talking about? I didn't say it. I was respectful to her. I was like, I don't know what you're saying to me. But okay, I understand what you're saying, but I don't know what you're saying. So I just, oh. I am in church now. This is my home. I'm in church now. I'm going to reign. Like, I'm going to reign. I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm, I'm going to be what I've been wanting to be for the last 15 of my 18 years. I'm going to be a Christian. Like, I'm going to be a Christian now. I've always wanted to be a Christian. I've always wanted to interact with Almighty God. Like, I heard him. I'm going to be with him forever. It's going to be me and him forever. Me and Jesus I'm going to be with him forever. I'm going to be like him on the earth. I'm going to be like Jesus. When I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm going to be reading about me through this one. Absolutely. I'm going to be him. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to be Jesus. Yeah, that's what I'm called to be. That's what Christians are called to be. I'm going to be that right there. And that's what I committed to. I'm going to be this. And that's what it was. And so I never went to church looking for females again. And so that, that same year, later that year, had a girlfriend, was about to do bad things, just about to do bad things, you know, and as I was on the brink of doing bad things, in the midst of, about, uh, of being about to do bad things, I heard the Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the grief, the, the conviction of the Lord came over me. I said, oh God, I'm sorry. I told her, I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then I left, went into my house, and I wrote, got a contract. I said, Lord, I'm going to do this, line one, line two, line three. And I signed it, I laminated it, and I put it in my wallet. This, it's still in my wallet. 
to this very day. Lord, I will keep my body for you until I am married. I will be yours, wrote it. And the Lord supported me when Brother Dave was too weak to keep that contract. The Spirit of God said, I'm going to help you because I've called you from the people to the people. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you what you need to be exactly who I've called you to be. I'm going to, oh, you love me? Oh, Lord, I love you. you. You spoke to me. I've been wanting to hear you my whole life. I've been wanting to see you my whole life. I love you. I've always loved you. But I was always under the control of the enemy. That was my day. And that day to this day, by the mercies and power of Almighty God through Christ Jesus. So you say, if, there's a me if there be a messenger with me, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show to man God's uprightness, it's because God is being gracious to you. Why are you allowed to watch this? Because God is being gracious to you. And he says, deliver him from going down to the pit. When God calls a person, one among a thousand, to the people, it's to deliver the people. He's being gracious to the people. If there be a messenger, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show the man his uprightness. Hey, God is right. You're like me. How do you know that there's a God? I am telling you, God is right. I don't know what you've drunk, who you've been with physically, where you live, where you've lived, what parties you've attended, what role you've achieved. God it's Jesus. It's about Jesus. He's right. If we are messengers, we are interpreters, we are one of thousands because God is being gracious to people who are on their way to death and hell like we were. That was us right there. I used to love that, too. I would stand in line for that just like you would. I would wear that just like you would. I would speak that just like you would. I would go there just like you would. I'd play that just like you would, man. I'm telling you, I understand why you're doing what you're doing. Because it's in my flesh to be that. But I've been called as an interpreter. We've been called as messengers because God's being gracious to the people. He's being gracious to the people. So that's it, guys. I'm telling you, Job 33, verse 8 down through 20, 8 down through 30. That's the word of God right there. And God's going to make your flesh fresher than a child's. Jesus said you must be born again. It's what he's promising to do. So I love you all in Jesus' name. And hopefully you are mighty. This is your brother David with Jesus Ministries. We'll talk.